So, Anik, do we usually have a critical mass at which point we start? Do we want a certain number of people or we start on time and uh, everyone just basically trickles? Maybe give it a minute, but uh, okay. yeah, yeah, just a minute. Or I guess you can go. I think it's slowing down uh, now the uh, the entrance. We have 20 participants. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Family Medicine Research Seminar. My name is Katja Lobin. I'm a doctoral student in the Department of Family Medicine. My research focuses on multi-stakeholder partnerships in primary health care. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Jeannie Haggerty. Um, who will be speaking on behalf of the team. Uh, the other team contributors to this particular presentation are Dr. Peter Nukas, Dr. Najib Makrawi. Dr. Jeannie Haggerty is a full professor in the Department of Family Medicine and a holder of the McGill Chair in Family Medicine and Community Medicine Research based at St. Mary's Hospital Center and McGill University. She's also a co-director of the McGill Practice-Based Research Network, or PBRN, which is the focus of today's presentation. Dr. Haggerty's domain of research is the factors related to accessibility and quality of primary care, particularly the impact of health system policies and reforms. Dr. Peter Nugus is an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine and at the Institute of Health Sciences Education at McGill University. He's also co-director co of the McGill PPRN. Peter's research and teaching has focused on workplace and organizational learning, care coordination, culture and identity in complex organizations and translation and mobilization of knowledge across knowledge producers and users. And finally, Dr. Najib Mukrawi is the coordinator and facilitator of the McGill PPRN since 2017. He's a general practitioner and completed a master's degree in clinical sciences at the University of Sherbrooke under the supervision of Jeannie Haggerty. His research interests are diverse, but mainly focus on the epidemiology of chronic diseases and multimorbidity. The title of today's presentation is Clinician Researcher Partnership to Produce Knowledge from and for Clinical Practice, Initiatives and Lessons Learned at the McGill Practice-Based Research Network. For those of you who might not know, the mission of the McGill Primary Care PBRN is to produce and apply research knowledge from and for clinical practice and with an ultimate goal of improving the quality of patient care. The PBRN is composed of nine McGill family medicine teaching sites and three family medicine clinics. The seminar today will present some clinician initiative research, sorry, clinician initiated research of the PBRN and some upcoming opportunities for involvement if you wish to get involved, as well as tools that are being put in place to enhance the collaboration between researchers and clinicians. The presentation will last approximately 30 minutes and we will have 25 minutes for a live discussion. This seminar is recorded. If you do not want to be in the recording, please turn your video off. As we proceed, you can type your questions in the chat. Si vous désirez, vous pouvez poser vos questions en français. Uh, they will be addressed during the question period. Alternatively, you can raise your hand during the question period. So Jeannie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katya. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm presenting on behalf of the PBRN before, as I said, but I'll be doing most of the presentation, but inviting Najib and Peter to jump in, as uh, especially if I say anything that's wrong and, and they want to correct me. Actually, before I start, I'd like to find out a little bit more about who you are. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to just launch a little poll and I'd like you to please tell me who you are and just here's uh, some choices. So if you could just enter who you are and we'll find out. So please take time and when you're down, you just submit your polling. All right, we have 20 people who've, en who've entered. I don't know how many participants we have, but I think that that's probably it. And I'll just share the results now. So we have a lot of graduate students and researchers in the, in the audience today. So I will definitely try to make it um, 
relevant, especially to you. I, so I may just jump over some parts, but uh, that, thank you very much. That's really helpful, actually. Um, so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to give just an overview of an introduction to practice-based research uh, networks generally, um, including why they're so important in primary health care. Um, we'll talk about some of the specific challenges in the Canadian context about supporting clinician-led and uh, clinician-relevant research. And then I really want to focus on some examples that we've been working with in the, our PBRN to give you an, a flavor about clinician-initiated uh, research and then how the, the research, uh, the PBRN can come along. And I definitely want at the very end to share some signature initiatives we're doing and give you an opportunity for involvement. So just before I start, one more poll I'm going to uh, do. Let me close this one and I'm just gonna ask you, the question is how many, oh, I don't know, I'm missing something here. Stop share results, that's what I have to do. And then I, I, here's one, I just wanna ask you, how many practice-based research networks do you think there are in Quebec? So if you could just, all right. Okay, great, super. And I think that they're all coming in and so I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. So as you can see, the principal answer is that there's four practice-based research networks in Quebec. In fact, this was a bit of a trick question and I should uh, stop sharing the results. There are four that we are really in involved with because there's each of the family medicine departments is associated with a practice-based research network, but there also is a Canada-wide research network that has a little uh, foothold in Quebec. And I'll come to that a little bit later, but we call it the Sipson network. Okay, so I just want to first, I'm going to start off and share my slides in order to, oh yeah, I have to share slides, I'm sorry. I'm going to um, just share with you some of the uh, beginnings of the practice-based research network. So can everybody see this? I know that you don't need to see this. Uh, just as a definition of practice-based research uh, is, is kind of the kind of research that's located in, informed by, and intended to improve primary care practice. So that's kind of like the functional or what we would call from the, from the trenches definition. Um, there, but we more sophisticated, we think of them as new clinical laboratories for primary care research and dissemination. So generally a, pri a pri primary care PBRN is our ambulatory practices that are devoted principally to service or teaching in our case often the primary care patients and they draw on their insight and experience as practicing clinicians to identify and frame their questions in a way that they can produce um, changes in practice. A generic mission for uh, practice-based research networks is to conduct healthcare. I'm having trouble seeing the whole screen here. To conduct healthcare and clinical research that matters in practice and in the community. And the, there's a whole approach of what we would call practice-based research methods. And these are uh, conducted in clinical settings to generate and disseminate practical knowledge. As Katya mentioned, our own McGill Primary Care PBRN, our mission is to produce and apply knowledge uh, from and for clinical practice in partnership with clinicians and uh, clinicians, researchers, patients, and organizations. So it's actually quite broad and I'll just come back to a little bit of the history of that. Our approach is really um, kind of like research with uh, clinical member sites through participatory outreach. And so the, the participatory approach is really the, um, what we're trying to focus on. And I realize there's some things on there that shouldn't be there. So um, practice-based research networks actually, they, are, they arose, oh, the history of our own practice-based research network. Yeah, I wanted to say that. Actually, it kind of started in 2011 when there was conversations at, between the different Quebec uh, departments of family medicine about having a, a primary care research network that was funded by the FRQS. So you may or may not know that there are research networks dedicated to specific topics in, uh, funded by the FR, FR, anyways, FRSQ. 
And um, so there's things on aged care. Um, anyways, there's all sorts of things, but primary care was not there. And it just happened that as we were having these conversations between departments at that time, um, there was this big initiative across Canada called the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research. And the Quebec strategy focused particularly on primary health care. The goal of um, the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research was to close the gap between clinical research and clinical practice. So in fact, um, I just want to do a shout out to Réjean Hébert, who was the Minister of Health at that time, also a primary care physician. And so he really put primary health care on the map for the patient-oriented research in Quebec. And then I also want to do a shout out to Howard Bergman, who was at that time scientific director of the FRQS. And he really rallied the troops for primary care in order to get us um, on the road to getting something funded from the FRQS. So in 2013, we actually got funding from the FRQS for what we now call the Raison 1 Quebec Network. And that is actually, uh, it's a, I can't remember the whole name, but it's a knowledge network for um, primary care services in Quebec. And I was the founding director of that. And every FRQS research network has to have a, have a kind of common uh, platform or a commonality that is going to bring people together. And in the case of uh, Raison 1, we decided that it would be a, the PDRN platform for research. So they began they, with the Raison 1, two new networks were started in Quebec, and one of them at Sherbrooke, and then one of them was at McGill. And our um, founding director was Pierre Cluy, who really set the direction for what we're doing through participatory research with organizations as being the orienting framework. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing now and just talk a little bit about what some of the challenge, why practice-based research networks are so important in, in primary health care. Um, they actually started, primary care research networks started kind of at the same time as uh, family medicine began as a discipline. As you know, family medicine is a very young discipline. It started in the late 70s. And it was actually a part of a movement that started in the 60s or late 50s to revalue the importance of general practice. It had been lost in the world of increasing specialization. So worldwide, there was this movement to um, revalue primary health care and uh, uh, primary care. And family uh, medicine was created and began, the first residency programs began in, the 19, in 1969. And in Canada, they began around uh, the 1970s. And one of the big things was that a primary care, as just like primary care and family medicine recognized the need for them to get training in the community, there was this equal realization about the importance of conducting research in the playing field that the uh, family physicians were actually practicing in. So, there was these things that got together, these groups that got together where they began to just ask certain questions. And this whole movement of primary care um, research networks really took off. And I would say that um, it kind of went inter, there was a big movement in the UK and there's a very well established and super successful network in the UK. And in Canada and the United States, it sort of started slowly and has been merging. And now that it really is a big movement. But for instance, I, one of the, they, they began actually asking questions ab about like, what were they seeing in their own practice? And often they were using very simple methods um, to, to answer the questions that they were seeing. So for instance, I just wanna give you an example of these practice-based research networks. They had these uh, new things doing, and uh, let me just share my screen again. And I wanna show you an example of a, Sorry, I need to do this properly. I keep clicking on the wrong thing. I want to just sh show you an example of, um, oops, looks like I have to go all the way down again. So I can't come back right there, can I? Sorry about this. I wanted to show you an example of these things called card studies that were done. And so these were basically index cards that doctors used to carry around in their pockets. And they'd say, we wanna see, for instance, 
um, how often headaches are the presenting complaint. And so people would have like for the week, they'd have this little index card in their pocket. And every time somebody came in complaining of a headache, they'd write down this information. So for instance, this is an example of a study that was done to examine kind of like the prevalence of um, pelvic inflammatory disease and also spontaneous abortions in primary care because they had this real feeling that the guidelines that they were being given were not appropriate for the kind of cases that they were being seen. So in fact, what they did find and were able to publish was that um, pelvic implant inflammatory disease was presenting in primary health care in a much different way that it seemed to be presenting in hospital and that it was a much less severe, the temperatures were lower. And so even when people met all the criteria for what according to guidelines meant they should be hospitalized, there was this sense that family physicians were saying, I don't think this needs hospitalization. So in fact, 43% of the um, pelvic inflammatory disease cases met the criteria for hospitalization but family physicians only hospitalized 9% and they felt that that was appropriate and they had no negative effects. They also found the same thing with spontaneous abortions that it was happening, the prevalence was much higher than was reported and that it could be managed predominantly in primary care and did not need emergency admissions in any way unless they were late trimester um, pregnancies. So these are just examples of the kind of, of a sort of typical practice-based research network. Um, family medicine has some particularities in the way that it practices that really pose some challenges and require some new ways of thinking about research. So for instance, um, as you may know, family physicians or primary care is responsible for managing, for diagnosing and managing the vast majority of health conditions that come through the door. And Barbara Starfield estimated that that was about 80% of presenting conditions. So that's a huge, you know, generalized um, area of focus. Um, plus it's across all the lifestyle. <clears throat> it's so, and conditions tend to present at an early stage, often undifferentiated. So physicians have to use time as a diagnostic tool often before they can actually, before the disease will manifest itself. So it's this kind of level of this, something called what we call low level surveillance where people come in and you can't, it's not like in the emergency room where they come in and, and it gets to be more obvious. Like there's this kind of low level surveillance. You could, if you miss it, it could be big, but if you treat it, it could cause problems. So sometimes they use a lot of time in their management. And actually there's a huge amount, uh, something as much as 30 to 40% of presenting symptoms never get medically diagnosed. It's just symptom management over time. The other thing that is a, a challenge for them is, so the whole idea of disease categories is quite different in primary care. And many of the randomized clinical trials that are done are not really relevant for primary care because the eligibility criteria are so narrow. And now increasingly in primary care, patients are multimorbid and the, you know, the prevalence is you know, 40 to up to 60% of patients come in with multiple morbidities. So the clinical guidelines don't always relate. And the other thing that happens in, in primary care that's kind of a challenge for practice is that, for research practice, is that family physicians see their patients over a long time. The average family physician practices for 40 years and many of them actually keep their patients that whole time, they, they age with their patients. But all the research that gets done is in these little snippets of time. So there's very little long, long longitudinal research. And actually some of the um, real heroes in, in primary care research have been just observant and reflective clinicians who began to observe what was happening. And I, I just wanna mention a couple of, couple of them. <clears throat> there's somebody called Will Pickles, who's a, an English uh, practitioner who was in, in the 20th century. And he was, he's actually considered one of the most important infectious disease epidemiologists because he was able to put together patterns of the transmission of infectious diseases like infectious hepatitis, uh, infectious pleurisy, measles, jaundice, and so on 
in a way that had not really been put together before just through observing what was happening in his rural country pack practice. Another really famous person, and I, I'm embarrassed because I don't even know how to pronounce his name, he's Dutch uh, from the Netherlands, it's um, Hugen, Hugen, oh, I don't even know how to pronounce it. I, I've only ever seen it written. That's really a terrible thing to admit. But <clears throat> over 40 years of his practice, he wrote this absolute treatise and did these incredible um, studies called, and it was on the medical life of families. So he just began systematically following his patients over time, over his 40 years and seeing all these patterns. So for instance, he wrote about the benefits of breastfeeding to babies. And then he was able to, to sort of show that that benefit lasted over time because he was following those same patients and being able to compare breastfeeding with not. So these are really, um, uh, so this is the kind of clinician type of innovation that comes from clinicians just observing their practice. Um, closer to home, I have some, some heroes and I'm gonna maybe mention them later on. I'm really terrified now to put up any slides because I seem to, to mess it up. But I did wanna talk about, for instance, um, some of the challenges in, in training uh, in the Canadian context for supporting clinician researchers. For instance, one of the biggest barriers is the fact that they have this very short training program. In fact, um, the Canadian Family Physician Training Program is one of the shortest in the world. There are some exceptions. Australia also has very short programs, but they have a very quick passageway into training for academic practice afterwards. So they have good links. In the United States, they differentiate between residents who are trained in hospital settings versus academic settings, but their minimum is a three-year training period. In academic settings, it's a four-year period with time for research. So it's a kind of, in Canada, we have this really short um, period for, for doing research. And what, what we found a few years ago, there was a, a study commissioned about primary care um, researchers. And there's this very typical pattern because what happens is that for family physicians, they have so much to master in such a short period, in such a short training period, that for them, it takes a, it, it re they really need their first five years in practice just to get their footing in clinical practice. So they only begin to feel really comfortable with their clinical knowledge and the fact that they're feeling competent after about five to 10 years. And then that's when clinicians start turning towards research. So that's when they begin asking the generative questions that actually result in really fascinating research. The problem is that that makes them out of phase with what is actually happening in, in the way that we support research, clinician researchers in other domains. So in other specialties, there's time for research. And then um, they oftentimes, it's just easier to get, to get into research because they've had more exposure. Whereas in family medicine, and, and, and it's easier to sort of define a particularly narrow focus that they're interested in. Whereas in family medicine, it takes a while to narrow their focus onto what they're interested in. And in the meantime, you know, five to 10 years have passed and they've kind of lost um, the, the window in which they could seek additional training. What used to happen was that family physicians could just turn to research. And actually some of my own heroes, and I do want to mention them, are people like um, Anne McCauley, for instance. So she was a leader through her work at Kanawagi in, um, in participatory research. She kind of really put it on the map via the, her work with the North American Primary Care Research Group. She was also one of the first researchers out there talking about um, the, the ethics and the proper way to deal with uh, and to do community-based research with indigenous populations. And all of this she was doing just based on her view from the trenches. Another one is Ellen Rosenberg. So she did seminal work as well, looking at um, the impact of limited language proficiency among immigrants and refugees and how we can actually provide good care to them. Mark Yaffe is another example who's still uh, you know, very active and he uh, has generated a tool for detecting elder abuse. And all of this is just coming from his view from the trenches. So 
we, um, I, I want to now just talk a, a little bit about where we are in Canada now um, and, and a particular uh, opportunity we have. And, and now I'm going to start to share my screen again, and I hope I'm not too lost. I haven't lost my pace. Oh, okay. I haven't actually lost my place. So, so from the card studies, we already did that. Here are my heroes, and I've mentioned some of them. Um, so I wanted to talk right now about the Quebec vision for promoting research that's relevant to primary health care. And a really important fact is that in 2019, of the 101 clinician investigators who had career awards at the FRQS, two of them were family physicians. So it's really a, an issue. And the four departments of family medicine have gotten together and cast a vision to create 20 clinician investigators over the next five years. The other thing that already this team has done is that they've given us a very interesting nomenclature about how to distinguish you know, different classes of research and involvement. So they talk about research collaborators. So these are people who um, are there principally as knowledge users and clinicians on research projects and they're doing researchers. And I did wanna just say, since most of us are researchers in the room, I want to just remind you that on CIHR grants, I wanna encourage you to in involve clinician, clinicians as collaborators, knowing that you can actually pay them to do research from your CIHR grant. So you're allowed to play collaborators in, in CIHR grants. I'm, so I'm sorry for my spelling here. The other category is this thing called clinicien enseignant chercheur, that it's a very clunky title but there is this group of people who are doing research mostly on their own time on evenings and weekends for about 20 to 10 to 20% of their time. And we don't quite know what to call them, but I'm gonna call them clinician researchers. And then there's the, what they call the clinicien chercheur. So these are the, the people who are clinician investigators and they do more 50% or more of their time in research as well as cl clinic. And so for instance, in our setting, um, uh, people like um, Alexandre de Pocamandi, Roland Grad, Bertrand de Le Boucher, these are clinician investigators who have their own teams. They actually have the research infrastructure. The focus of the vision is on the clinicien chercheur. But for us in the, in the practice based re research network, our part in the sandbox is to really try to promote the context into the larger context by, by developing collaborators and clinician researchers. So I just wanna to talk today, I wanna to mention three examples of some of the people that we've been working with um, and just talk about, uh, give them as examples of their journey uh, of, of, you know, I, calm down. So I wanna give them as examples so that you can see the type of questions they ask the kind of support that they needed, and then also um, how clinician, how researchers can come alongside and play an important role. So the first one I want to talk about is um, is uh, Isabelle Leblanc, and for her it's really a journey from being a, a collaborator to somebody who is now an ins aspiring clinician researcher. And so Isabelle Leblanc, I think I'm going to stop my. I'm going to stop my screen share now that I know I can get back there. So Isabelle Leblanc is a family physician at St. Mary's Hospital who had an MSc in, in anthropology before starting her medicine, medical practice. And true to, to form, true to the pattern, after about 10 years, she began really getting interested in research subjects and also in advocacy generally. I involved her as a collaborator on one of my projects um, in starting in 2018. I'm uh, the embedded researcher at St. Mary's Hospital. That's where my research chair is. So I was working with her as a collaborator and we began working quite closely. And that it was a project that was for volunteer navigators that kind of got sidelined during the pandemic. But she came to me during the pandemic and she said, you know, I'm not seeing my socially vulnerable patients in telemedicine, can we figure out what's going on? So we, we, we 
went rapidly and we worked with, we actually put in a grant to um, Réseau One and some other uh, FFQS networks with Elaine Adams on, can we explore the telemedicine experience among socially vulnerable patients? So we are just at the end of that project now where Isabelle Leblanc, you know, functioned as like a full um, co-principal investigator with Elaine Adams on there. And it's, it's found some really interesting results, which we hope we'll have a chance to share with you at one point. But also in the process of that, I invited Isabelle to be a, a co-investigator on one of my other grants. And she was asking such penetrating and interesting questions about the way that mental health um, problems are detected in primary care, that when the chance came up with the Raison One to do a, a proposal, there's a, they have these small projects for $5,000 to, to actually develop a proposal. Isabelle and Elaine put in a proposal that they're now working on. And it the, the proposal looks at how experienced family physicians who work with multicultural populations, what are the indices that they use to be able to detect that a presenting problem is actually psychological distress and not a backache or a headache or something like that. So she's actually moving now into the area of transcultural primary care mental health care, which has been well developed in psychiatry, but really not in, in primary care. So she is now really interested in kind of reorienting her career and finding out how she can change her schedule to increase time for, for doing research. So the, and the other person um, I want to just highlight is um, Fanny uh, Herson Ettery. And this is a way where actually, I think that the process of getting research ethics to do something can actually be a kind of orienting guide for where we can step in and help people. At our PBRN, we're really trying, Najib is trying to develop um, a really strong capacity to be able to guide people through the research ethics process. And um, so Fanny came to us a, a year ago, in fact, um, with, a, with an idea, what, with a project that she wanted to submit to ethics, but it needed to get scientific review first. And in the process of arranging for scientific review, we realized that there were some, there were some issues with the protocol. So we, we said, you know, th this has got to be changed. And we went back, we had a lot of back and forth. And I wanna just say that what we found in that was it really helped us determine that what we're looking for with these practice-based research projects is something that creates kind of a signal. So we're not asking to solve a huge problem that takes, these are unfunded studies usually. They're done in clinician times off the side of their desk. And so it has to be really simple and we just have to get generate enough of a signal to say, yeah, there's something going on. This is worth doing, getting more funding for it. And here's my, like I, my shout out to Elena Adams. My shout out here is to Kate Rice, who stepped in and took a project that was predominantly quantitative and generated a really nice, small, robust, qualitative study that then we finally submitted to ethics and hopefully it will get done and generate a, a nice signal that somebody can act on later. And it's really exploring the extent to which the, the experience of physicians when in their own obstetrical care, what it's like to be a physician and a patient at the same time. And then the final example I want to give is uh, an example of Vanya Jimenez. I don't know if any of you were at the Global Health Scholars Program, but she just gave this absolutely elaborate, uh, elegant um, description of the Maison Bleu and the super important role that it plays in providing a care home for um, new arrivals to Canada, and especially those who do not have a strong uh, research network. And we have another initiative in uh, our PBRN, which we call PBRN Fellows. So these are graduate students who are attached to specific clinics or specific projects. And they just kind of spend some time seeing what the practice of, uh, is in, like in the clinic or what the clinician's practice is like and then eventually developing a common project that they can work on together as part of our proposal development process. And so she was working with Juan Pimental, who was a, 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 her PBRN fellow. And together they've come up with this absolutely 
innovative and elegant way of doing an impact evaluation for, for the work that's done at um, Maison Bleu using the methods that, that Juan really knows very well and then really inserted very much into the life of Maison Bleu. So those are just examples, three examples I wanted to give you about how um, the, the PBRN is, uh, is helping out. So I'm actually coming, um, I'm almost at the end and I just want to once again, get back and share my PowerPoint, but actually there's, I'm gonna launch a poll while I'm getting ready for you. <laughs> I do have one last poll. I forgot to tell you that actually um, there is the biggest network, the most widespread network in Canada is something called the Sipson network. So I just wanted you to just um, decide, tell me what you think Sipson stands for. Okay, you're very clever. I should have known. Yes, Sipson does stand for the Canadian Primary Care Sentinel Surveillance Network. And that word comes from, it was at one point designed as a sentinel surveillance for um, influenza. That's what it's, uh, how it started. And uh, that's why the sentinel comes in. And at the beginning of PBRNs, the word sentinel appeared a lot because they thought that they were really in a place to give signals to the rest of the system, which doesn't happen that often. But yes, we do, we do want to have something that primary care that's comprehensive, that connects service and science. So thank you for those of you who voted for that one too. Appreciate that. Now, and now I'm gonna share my screen and hope I'm in the right place. Okay, so I wanna talk just about some of our signature initiatives that we're doing with uh, our, in our PBRN in my last few minutes here. Um, so the first thing that, as I've already mentioned, is that we, our, our coordinator, Najib, uh, Najib, can you say hi to everybody so that your camera shows on? We all know exactly what you look like. Shut them all. Najib is not at the beach, for those of you who are worried about that. <laughs> so uh, he is, uh, so what, Najib is, is developing and really working hard to develop a lot of know-how about the research ethics approval process. So he is in touch with all the different uh, approval, different SUSEs that provide ethics coverage for our member clinics. And so he's, he has a good handle on what works, what doesn't work. Also where the McGill uh, um, Research IRB, the Institutional Review Board comes in. For instance, you know, uh, the, if you're doing research with physicians only, go through the IRB, but as soon as you are, do any research that, that deals with patients or nurses as part of the SUSE, you have to go through the SUSE ethics. So we're just trying to figure out what are the pathways when is it good to go, go for uh, QI projects versus not? So Najib is developing that and is really there, especially to help the clinician researchers. We've also put in a place into place a, a, a process where we're trying to really help um, clinician researcher dyads develop uh, research proposals. And we just, want it, we just think that there's things for the clinicians to learn about what it takes to do research and all the different components and things that you need to think about. And then also for the researchers to learn what it means to do actually research-based practice with small R research, things that need to be embedded into the routine of the clinic and so on. We have a research readiness assessment of our member clinics, and we are going to be doing that again this summer updating that. So just getting a sense of do they have a mechanism in place for receiving research projects? What is their readiness in terms of um, ethics and getting local investigators and so on? And we're happy to share that with you if, if you're interested. 
Peter Nugas. Peter, could you want to say hi? So everybody, know, everybody knows who you are, but hi, here I am. Hello, everyone. Here you are. <laughs> So Peter and Najib have been working with a group of engineering, uh, software engineering students to develop a searchable database <clears throat> of practice-based research and QI projects and the people who are doing them. So this is a way that we can actually find out more quickly what's happening in all the different clinics. The clinics can use it for deciding if they can actually handle another project. So if they get a request and they're saying, I'm really sorry, but We've got two projects who are in data collection now, but there's no way we can handle another one or something like that. It also allows them to see what are the QI projects that are being done in other areas that might be of interest to them and helps them, helps us to connect to clinicians who have specific research interests or specific clinical interests we can connect to. And we can also identify researchers by their level of interest. So this we're hoping we're we're in user testing for that this summer. We're going to, we're launching it in in three clinics in Gatineau, St. Mary's and the Queenie. And once they tell us that, yes, this is useful, this is usable, we'll be launching it wider. And we're also working on sets of tools that researchers can use for contacting and collaborating with clinics. You know, what are, what are like good ways of contacting the clinics? What are the processes to go through? Um, and we're working very closely with uh, Alexandre de Pocamandi as the research director to make sure that we have like a really coherent approach for the department. We think that there's some really unique opportunities for our PBRN and we have a slow start and um, but we really feel like we're picking up speed and we always felt a little bit like we were behind everybody else but it feels like now we've got some really unique strengths. So relative to other academic departments, we just it's just fantastic that our fields of application or our, sa our sandbox to play in is, are just outside our ivory tower, that we don't actually have to sort of walk very far to get to a clinical practice from where we do most of our research. We also have some other advantages next to compared to other PBRNs. We have having grad students is amazing gives us access to PBRN fellows. We have a QI lead for our department. This proposal development process is great. The fact that we're bilingual really opens doors for us and allows us to develop you know, a strong set of tools. And our research department, as you know, is really cool. So what opportunities do you see? What opportunities are there for getting involved? If you're a clinician, we invite you to be one of our PBRN champions at, one of, at your own clinic where we can sort of like connect with you and just get a sense of what's happening in the clinic. What do we need to be aware of? We are looking for a clinician to join our executive as a co-director and just kind of give us again, that frontline view. If you're a researcher, um, I, you might consider just the practice of providing research consultation. Peter and I hold regular PBRN hours on Tuesdays and Wednesdays where people can drop in and consult. And that seems to be very, um, successful and it's great when a clinician has a question that they know they can get an answer within a week and just working together. You might interest, be interested in joining a project or a site. Tracy Barnett, for instance, is very attached to the Chateau Gay site, Samira to um, Herzl, I'm at St. Mary's. But if you want, if there's a particular site that really interests you in what they're doing, then let us know and we'd be happy to connect you with a particular site. For graduate students, we really hope that you would consider being a PBRN fellow if you are especially a PhD fellow and you've, all, you've had experience doing uh, as a Tannenbaum fellow. And otherwise, let us know if you're available for any short-term research assistant work because there's always a need to plug people in to do you know, six hours doing this or something like that. So if we knew that we had a group of people, a group of research assistants that we could work with, that would be great. So I want to just uh, thank our main funder, which is Réseau One, and we receive a small funding from the Department of Family Medicine to support clinician research projects every year. I want to especially thank Dr. Marianne Dove and Alexander de Pocamanzi, with whom we just have had so much pleasure working together and aligning our efforts. And we just feel like we're in this whole new place of, of combining the, the worlds of research and clinic. A special shout out to Pierre Pruy, who really set the strong foundations for our PBRN network and who is, you know, an example, continues to be a, a real example to us for how to do that. I want to really thank clinicians who dare to ask questions. 
to make things better for patients. And there's so many hero researchers. I especially want to uh, applaud Tracy, Kate, Elena, for just being willing to learn practice-based research methods and support clinicians. As you know, this does not show up on our performance. You can't, you, nobody gives you brownie points for being available. So when you are available to clinicians, um, it's really important and we'd like to change that, but hopefully that will happen soon. So I'm open for questions now. If you have really hard ones, Peter's willing to answer them and he's, he's been preparing for this. That's what he's been doing while I've been blah, blah, blah. -ing. And if you've got really easy questions or something like that, I'm, I'm here for you. Thank you very much, Jeannie. Um, we will have um, just a little bit of time for a question period, and then we will um, ask Alexandra to close the seminar. Um, so I don't see any questions in the chat. Would uh, people like to ask their questions? Um, Kate has a... I see Kathleen rising, raising her hand. Thanks very much, Jeannie. Um, that was actually really helpful for me, having already been sort of embedded in the PBRN to, to put it a bit more in context. Uh, I have a, a kind of a tough and honest question. I didn't hear you talk very much about efforts to actually build research capacity skills among clinicians. You talked about working with someone already with an MSc, but a real challenge that I've experienced uh, in my career so far, not necessarily in my specific to uh, the collaborations I've done with the PBRN is working with clinicians who don't necessarily have the research skills to realize the project that they're envisioning. Uh, and I think it, it often with physician uh, researcher collaborations ends up, it ends up that the researcher pulls, carries a lot of, does a lot of heavy lifting, I suppose in terms of actually moving the project forward. Uh, and that is fine from project to project, but it doesn't actually build any research capacity among clinicians. And I personally don't think it's great for to finish a research project uh, and not with, where the clinicians have the same skill set essentially that they had at the beginning, just with more knowledge. And I also think it's a little bit um, exploitative and doesn't do justice to the skills that we bring to the table. There's sort of a dark joke that we have in medical anthropology. Oh, I've studied medicine enough. I think I'm gonna start practicing. You know, like I would never assume that I could start treating patients just because I've, I really understand how to research the healthcare system. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that issue a little bit and perhaps talk about some ideas that you have or maybe some other people here as well. I would imagine Alexandra might have some thoughts on this as well on how these collaborations can actually be used to help foster research skills among clinicians. Thank you so much for that, Kate. And I, it's absolutely an issue. Um, it's like in an ideal world, there wouldn't be enough research assistants to go around to answer all the questions that, that clinicians can generate, right? But I think that our, what are the answering that we're settling on and having done some sort of backwards uh, assessment of things that have happened, we really think that our, our, our uh, putting in place a proposal development process that's much more formal is really important. And that takes people through the, you know, bit step by step, like this is how you have to ask the question. And, and then you, you keep having to say, no, it has to be smaller. No, it, you know, so something that can start off with a perfectly simple question and then suddenly the clinician wants to know, yeah, but why does that happen? Oh, I'm sorry, you've just gone from it being an EMR study to being a qualitative research study for which you need ethics approval. And so it's like that kind of guiding we're realizing is really important. And we're trying to develop tools that we think that that proposal development process is just really critical to be in a little bit of a community of practice of other people who are going through it. And I think that for, for um, for researchers, there's a learning curve too of, of being able to say, okay, so you want something that's going to be doable with basically no funding. That means that your survey actually can only be five questions long. So some of that know-how needs to be brought in. We're on a learning curve, Kate, and I think that we have so much to learn, but I, I'm just so convinced that both researchers and clinicians have something to learn in this. And I think it's a failure personally, 
when a researcher is used as a research assistant to generate a proposal, when it hasn't gone through, you know, the, the gray matter. And, and, you know, sometimes we find that it's, it can be pretty shocking for clinicians to realize that they're, they have great clinical judgment and they know when the right thing is to do with the right person. But when you translate that into what somebody else is going to do to every single patient they see, then it's like, oh yeah, it's true. I can't, I can't just, I can't trust the judgment of my research assistant to decide who to recruit. I actually have to say all this stuff, you know? So doing that step-by-step, step, I think is what we're doing. And, you know, and once again, we're looking for people who will be collaborators and researchers who were, who were kind of doing maybe 10 to 20% at most of their research time. Does that answer your question? And really, we're, we're making, I, I really want to see this, I, I think that our department is in a place to make this part of, recognize as part of academic merit, because it is really tough to do well. I do think that is key, actually, because I mean, those of us who do take time to collaborate, I, I really enjoy doing it. I think it produces really great research. And I obviously think that clinicians and researchers both have important stuff to bring to the table, but it, it takes time. It does. Thank you. I believe Alexandra wanted to say something. Yeah, I just want to add, yeah, I fully recognize that. And I remember when you mentioned, like, you know, how people can think that they know things. I remember I was uh, at the social event and somebody was saying that, oh, they know about medicine. They read the book, <laughs> the book. <laughs> so it's a bit the same with research, John. You know, you haven't read the book and know it all um, either. But um, I feel that we have to remember first that in med school, there is some basic training give, you know, provided. The thing is that we forget about it if we don't use it, but we know how to read normally scientific literature. So there's some ground that is somewhere out there. And then when people want to use it, then it's a matter of like adapting. And there have some clinicians asking me, what training should I do? And in my mind, it's like, either you do a master degree <laughs> to do research or go with what you need as you go. So I think uh, Jeannie and Peter, I think we can continue thinking about this and maybe build tiny modules that clinicians could actually review, really targeted to what they're working on. So they don't have to ha do a full curriculum, but actually could go get what they need and that could offload a bit the researcher. The other thing I feel is that we really have to optimize our collaborations and what each can do because the researchers are studying clinical care and the clinician actually knows way better about that and, and could actually interpret the results something sometimes better or like so the, the, the roles of each are not at the same place and this really has to be optimized and in the collaboration the expectations and, and, and the <clears throat> sharing of the task should be really balanced, knowing each other's forces and tasks and clarified. Um, but that's something that we need to be working on as we go and experiences like yours, uh, Kate, it, I think this is goal to actually go forward and trying to see how we can make uh, improvements and stuff. Uh, and I fully agree that the recognition for researchers involvement has to be uh, has to be there. So we, we know that your uh, sharing your experiences with, with me or with Jeannie is key to for us to actually grow and develop uh, as we go and improve and facilitate these collaborations. Thank you, Alexandra. I think that a suggestion of small modules is really a great one. Thank you. We have time for another quick question before we wrap up, if anyone is interested. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I want to thank you. And I, I just want to say that part of the challenge in, the, in, in doing this is that you learn from mistakes. And so I really want to thank everybody who's been working with us since 2000. And when did we start, Pierre? 2013. And, you know, we've made a lot of mistakes. So that's why we're so terrific. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say that. I, what I mean is that we really are trying to learn from our mistakes. But every time, even if you're frustrated, just let us know. It's our job to learn from mistakes and make it better. 
But Jeannie, I just want to highlight that I've worked with other researchers in the past who were a mistake to collaborate with. You know, like it's collaboration is, you know, involves multiple types of experiences. So it's not that the fact that it's with clinicians or with the network, it's just what collaborating is, right? Yeah. And then so and, and small and ideas that seems to be small at the beginning, like the first one was by residents in 2010 about patients with complex skin needs became an idea of the division of our department, became a PBRN project, and then became a provincial demonstration project. <laughs> this now given birth to multiple different projects. You know, a residence idea can become really, give a lot of flowers. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeannie, Peter, and Najib. It's been really uh, great, and we learned a lot today. We uh, do have a lot of questions when we hear those acronyms, so thank you so much for, uh, for, uh, for explaining them to us and also um, informing us of how we can contribute moving forward. Alexandra, did you want to say a couple of um, uh, words about yeah. our next research seminar? Uh, yes, and I just want to thank you again, uh, Jeannie and Peter, for presenting this. I feel we we are a big research uh, pro pro program and department. There's lots of research, and and you know it's good to be refreshed on what the history and what everyone's doing. And so that was so useful. So uh, thank you so much. Now this was the last uh, seminar research seminar of this year. So I hope everyone has great vacation and enjoy. Yay! Yes. <laughs> So uh, the dates, uh, uh, Nick, if you can post the next dates of uh, the, um, yeah, so next year's dates are there to put in your agenda in the chat, you can see them. So the next one is September 10th um, and uh, we will continue on highlighting these research being done in our departments, great collaborations being done in departments. Some of uh, the research seminars will be presented by PBRN. There was the, uh, the FMAR also has some uh, seminars uh, that are added. So uh, I wish everyone a great uh, summer and I'll see you again on probably before in some Zoom meeting, but for these <laughs> seminars on September 10th. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Najib and Peter. Thanks, Jeannie. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Alex. Bye.